uh, thesis presentation by uh, Alicia Rosenzweig, whose thesis is generally on the topic of cash networks, their analysis, their management, um, and, and protocols associated with in-network caching. Um, the way we'll, we typically do these presentations is that Alicia prepared a presentation that clocks in at like 52 minutes, something like that, but people can ask questions along the way. Um, at the end, we'll have, just see if there are any more questions, and then we'll go into a closed session uh, among the committee. So, uh, without any further ado, let me turn the uh, floor over to Alicia. Okay. Oh, sorry. So hello everyone, uh, my name is Alicia Ozitzweig and this is my uh, dissertation uh, presentation. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank my committee, uh, Professor uh, Rose, my advisor, for, for everything he's done, and Professor Towsley, Jensen, and uh, Gal for their um, willingness to be on my, on my committee here. And um, as Jim said, I'll start going through it, but please stop me at any point if you have any questions. So before I talk about cash networks, uh, I'd like to first talk about some concepts which will be with us or give us a context for why this research is, is coming up now. Um, and that relates to ICN, which is Information Central Networking, and specifically just some properties of caches and what makes the cache networks different than other cache systems that we already, that we already know from, from uh, existing technologies. So the initial um, way that the internet was devised, the, the protocols that were used in the internet were devised, was were designed sort of to, to uh, answer the question, how do we connect between two points in the network? How do we locate, let's say, uh, some, some website xyz.com? But as time goes on, we find that people are using the internet more and more to answer a different question, which is how do we find content in the network, regardless of where that content may be? And the truth is that the, the question of where that content is is not a simple question, because it's not always in the same place. It's constantly moving around, the people, those that host it, for example, in peer-to-peer -peer systems are, are coming up and going down, and so where that content is is also in flux. The answer to this might be also drawn from, we can draw some inspiration from TCP IP. Um, in TCP IP, or packet uh, switching in general, we come along and say we know that the locations which are communicating between each other, the, the two hosts, are fixed. But what's changing is the path that, we, that is going to constantly be, perhaps links will go up, will go down, and so, we basically keep those endpoints fixed, and we let, with packet switching, we let the path we determine on the fly, and it can change over time. <coughs> and in a similar way, with host to content communication, where we specify some sort of content idea that we're interested in, the content and the host remain the same throughout the session, but what's changing is maybe where the content is, which we don't know in advance, and so the content is also, so we can determine the path to the content on the fly. Um, the thing is that uh, once you have uh, the, these communication protocols that specify the content ID you're interested in, and you can identify content by this ID, then you can now also allow routers to reuse the content. Because once they have the content, another request comes in specifying this content ID, they can satisfy the request with what they already have. But for that, we need to store the content for some sort of short period of time and, make, and reuse it, assuming that it's being requested again. So, as a result, many of the leading proposals use caching uh, in, their, in their system. So now, just a little bit about so the kind of graphic notation we're going to use in this, in this talk. So we have a classic router, uh, which we all, we all know, and then we want to add to it some storage, some caching storage. So we're going to use um, this to, note, to denote these cache routers. And also, throughout the talk, I'm going to use squares to denote content items and circles of the same color to denote a request for that content. So what happens in the cache network? The basic operation of such a network is that our consumer here on top requests a piece of content, this black piece of content, which you can see at the bottom is present in the content custodian. And it's also present in this scenario at a cache, a cache router 
um, on the way. So there, the doer requests the content, then the, content, the request is routed towards the content custodian, which we assume always exists. And in route to the custodian, it checks these cached routers to see if the content is present there. Until it locates the content, whether at a custodian or at a router. And then once it locates it, the content is downloaded to the consumer, and the cache routers along the way store this content that pass through them. So now that we understand sort of what these cache, cache networks are, let's try to understand what is the additional complexity that uh, we have now that we're looking at uh, cache networks. What is different in, in this and these topologies than what we already have, what we already know? So if we look at a standalone cache, see over here you have a cache and you have this uh, custodian with several pieces of content. And what a cache basically does is it uh, filters the request stream. Hey, requests come into the cache, it either satisfies the request in which case it blocks the request from being propagated forward, or it satisfy, or, or it doesn't have the content and then it forwards the request on towards the custodian. Since the caches have a limited capacity, so they, they have to uh, evict things from their storage in order to make room for new storage. And so these are called replacement policies, and in this talk and in our work, we will be referring mainly to LRU, the least recently used replacement policy, which essentially evicts when you need to evict content, it evicts from the cache the content that was least recently accessed at the cache. Now, modeling even a single cache um, is very difficult, even when the policies are simple. For at least for LRU and FIFO, modeling these systems is not is not trivial. So many have proposed uh, to use approximations in order to evaluate this uh, to evaluate the cache cache behavior. So moving on to single caches, what do we what we do know that we have uh, networks of caches such as cache hierarchies, and in these systems, what you have basically is you have a set of caches over here at the bottom, and requests coming in either from lower down in, the, in this hierarchy or from exogenous requests from uh, a user, and whatever misses take place there are forwarded to the next level in the hierarchy until eventually they reach this mountain custodian. So in the example over here, for example, you can see that if you look at this path over here, all the request paths are pointing up. And this is a property of these hierarchies that the requests are all forwarded in the same direction along each link. And also the download is forwarded along in the same direction along each link, but in the opposite direction of the request. Now, when we look at cache networks, we have several features that didn't exist earlier in, in hierarchies. First of all, the custodians, the multiple custodians, and the content can be spread in arbitrary ways and over an arbitrary topology. And this means, for example, that the same router might forward, forward requests in different directions. That fact also means that we have what we call cross flows, meaning along the link, or along each link, you might have requests moving in both directions. Uh, and not just in one direction as we have in hierarchies. And finally, we also have state dependency uh, loops, which you can see over here that the um, node v1 over here, because it forwards requests to v2, will affect its state, because content will be downloaded and stored at v2. And v2 forwards requests to v3, and v3 to v4, and v4 back to v1. So you get these dependency loops where the state of uh, one cache affects, uh, can also sort of be a loop where it affects itself uh, once more. And this cannot happen in a cache, in a, in a cache uh, tree, because the requests are only forwarded in one direction. So if we look at really what the analysis challenge is when we look at cache networks compared to cache hierarchies, we find that uh, analyzing and modeling these systems is more difficult because in a, in a hierarchy, you have some ordering in which you can analyze the system. You can basically solve it from the bottom up. You start from the bottom, and then you treat, you look at this cache, you know what its input stream is, you compute its output stream, and then once you've done this for all the lower level, you can then just look at the next level, and you have this new arrival stream, which is composed by the misses from the previous, from the lower level, and you can sort of roll it up that way, compute the, the system that way. The one way in which you might uh, be impacted by where exactly your request is satisfied, and in a sense be dependent on the level in the tree, is if you had delay in the system. But most models of caches, even of individual caches, they don't, they don't incorporate that delay, that download delay into their, into their model. The second system, which might be worthwhile uh, giving two seconds of attention to, in terms of the similarity of the models you can build, is circuit switching. So, in circuit switching, you have points A and B, 
and you want to set up a call between points A and B, so you allocate circuits along a set of links. And um, in a, so in a similar way, when you try to set up, when you try to set up a call like that, you're trying to basically find a path between those two points, A and B, which is similar to a request traversing the network towards the custodian. And when you can't allocate a resource in a, in a, in a, a circuit in circuit switching, that basically is like your blood, you block the call, which is similar to a request getting blocked, so to speak, by a cache hit, where it stops there and doesn't reach its, its location. Um, one of the important differences between these systems, though, is that in circuit switching, when a call is dropped, all the resources that were used for that call are dropped simultaneously. Call all the circuits are released at the same time. But in cache in, in cache networks, while it's true that a download of content will cause neighboring caches to have the same content because they all stored it along the download path, what when that content gets evicted is not as tightly coupled as it is with um, with circuit switching. So with that background, we'll now give a quick overview of the thesis, and then we'll talk about each one of the individual chapters and conclude with some concluding remarks. So first we'll talk about ANET, which is an approximation algorithm for computing the uh, behavior of cache networks. It's iterative and fixed point, so one of the contributions we made um, is that, of, that we show that it converges for FIFO and random replacement policies, and meaning if the, if the underlying replacement policies and the caches are either random or or if I were a mixture of these, it will it will converge. It will assure, we can assure that it will converge. In our experiments, which we use LRU primarily, we also it converge every time. So there was no, um, we just don't have yet uh, theoretical proofs for that. We also did extensive performance evaluation, and we also will discuss uh, factor analysis of the approximation error, understanding where um, sort of what causes this to, this approximation not to give us the, the exact results. And this is uh, a paper. Uh, the most, like the, the basic, um, most of the information that we show here was uh, in a paper from 2010 and uh, The next topic, which is uh, a completely new piece of work over here, is that of network calculus, where instead of trying to approximate the flows um, in the, that, are, that are flowing in the system, we try to bound them instead. And here we define what these flow bounds are, we prove some bounding theorems for LRU, which can be expanded with these two FIFO as well, and we prove LRU um, that use these results to show that LRU does sort of caps the takes the arrival stream and it caps it to generate the midstream, and we'll see this in a moment. And we also ran some experiments to see exactly how um, how indeed do cache networks behave under um, um, with LRU using this uh, how, how closely to the bounds. And this was submitted to Infocom 2013. And since this is new work, all this material is is, is new. Since the, since the proposal. Um, the, four, the third chapter talks about ergodicity of cache networks, where essentially we try to investigate what is the impact of the initial state of caches on the uh, long-term behavior of the network. We demonstrate that um, indeed there are cache network examples where this, where the initial state can impact very, very strongly the long-term long behavior of the network. And we for, therefore we formulate conditions that can ensure that the cache networks are indeed ergodic. As part of that, we also show that certain replacement policies can be grouped into equivalence classes, where if you show that your replacement policy belongs to that equivalence class, you can know that the system will be ergodic. And this is also submitted uh, to Infocom 2013. And here we haven't made any additional contributions since the proposal, so we're only going to briefly we'll review it uh, over here. But of course, I have you know backup slides for uh, deeper discussion of it if we need to. Finally, the fourth and last chapter is that of uh, breadcrumbs, where here we try to determine how to search for content in this uh, basically distributed uh, cache system. And we present breadcrumbs, which is an approach that uses implicit coordination between caches. By implicit, I mean that caches don't share explicitly their state with their neighbors, so that there's no um, sort of no broadcasting of this is what I have in my cache and making decisions based on that. And here, also, we've added some things since uh, 20, 2009 when this appeared in the mini conference in uh, Infocom. Uh, we've shown properties of uh, breadcrumbs. We've uh, done an extensive exploration of performance. And we also uh, presented some uh, causality anal analysis trying to determine the uh, impact of routing versus caching. Um, basically, does breadcrumbs improve performance um, because of its uh, better search or because of the con where, how content is distributed in the network. So with that overview done, we'll now go in, in depth to each one of these topics. 
So we'll start with a net. So with a net, we have the, file, this is the problem. The problem we're trying to solve is as follows: We have a description of a cache network, and we want to determine the behavior of this network. So what does that mean? We take the topology, we take the uh, placement of where all the content is, is, is distributed in the custodians. We have a router, we have a routing matrix that determines where requests, where misses are forwarded, or are, are routed, sorry. Um, for each cache, we know the cache size and the replacement policies being used there. And we also know what the arrival process of requests is at each node in the network. Requests are generated exogenously by, by the users. And the output of this algorithm is going to be a per, the per cache behavior uh, of the system, where basically we look at, we say, what are the arrival rates at each node, and what is going to be the miss rate at each node. Given those two parameters, the arrival rate and the miss rate, we can compute many properties of the network. We can derive from that the miss probability of each cache, and for that we can determine the load on custodians, what actually is the load that arrives on the custodians, what is going to be, how far will you need to search for the, the locate content, and, uh, and similar uh, um, properties as well. So the notation we'll use here is as follows. We have, we already know these cache routers, and we have a consumer here that's generating requests exogenously. So if we look at VI over here, um, VI receives a uh, total rate of requests, which is RIJ. That is basically the rate of requests for at node I for file J. And the misses are, the rate of misses is SIJ, which is the, the misses of requests for file J at node I. This RIJ, this combined request rate, is combined of land IJ, which is the exogenous request arriving directly from the user connected to this node, and the misses from neighboring caches, which are forwarded to, which are which are routed to this node. And we also have this parameter here, RH, which is uh, denoting the routing table. So RHIJ, RHIJ is saying um, the probability, of what fraction of requests or file J um, arriving that are misses at node H are going to be forwarded to <coughs> node I. Okay, so we can have any value here between zero and one, and that's uh, and, and but we assume that that, that, that uh, um, routing matrix is is static. And then what ANET does is it takes the topology, it takes the exogenous requests arriving from each file, it takes the routing matrix, which we assume is static in the sense that I mentioned before, and it also takes a standalone cache approximation algorithm for each one of the replacement policies that uh, we have. So what this means is that we have, uh, we want to try to compute the behavior of the entire network, but each individual cache is running its own replacement policy, say LRU, random, or anything else, and we need to have a tool to approximate the behavior of those, of those nodes. Um, so we assume that we have that, and we'll talk about the implication of using these uh, in just a moment. Once ANA takes all this into account, it produces what we want. It produces the arrival rates and it produces the miss rates for each file and each node. So how did ANA do this? So we said at the beginning that it's an iterative fixed point algorithm. So we start here at the top left corner. We have uh, RIJ, we set the overall arrival at each node to be lambda IJ. And then, because at the moment we don't know of any misses, we have no miss streams that we know of. We compute, using the SA algorithms, the misses that will occur at each node. Once we have those misses, we're going to use the routing matrix to determine the new combined rate, which will now be of the exogenous rates, plus whatever misses are, are, are sent to each node. Once again, with these new arrival rates, we'll compute using the same SAA algorithm the behavior at each node, and we can continue this process until it converges. And as I mentioned earlier, we used LRU, and in our experiments, LRU will always converge to a fixed point, but what we so far have been able to find uh, analytical proofs that if you have F FIFO random or a mixture of these, you will have a uh, short convergence in the network. Now, I mentioned before that we're using these SA algorithms, and these algorithms tend to make assumptions on the exogenous arrivals. And since they are built for uh, standalone uh, performance, then um, while these assumptions might be valid for the exogenous arrivals, they're not necessarily valid for the flows within the system, the misses. The specific assumption that I'm referring to now is the independence reference model, IRM, which um, if xj is the jth request arriving at a certain node, so the probability that the jth request will be from file i is independent of previous requests. This basically is what the IRM model states. 
by using algorithms that were approximation algorithms that were designed for IRM, we basically risk the fact that maybe they're not suitable for non-IRM flows. And indeed, as we shall see, they do have an impact. But regardless, we use this because there's a um, uh, we're inspired by the idea, which has been shown for other systems, such as blocking networks, that if you take a system and you and you make it larger, you take it, you scale it up, that these dependencies um, become negligible. So we'll show an example of the performance of Inca, um, or several examples. Um, we have, we, we look here at a 10 by 10 torus topology, uh, 500 unique files that uh, are divided amongst four custodians. The custodians are placed in such a way that the minimal distance between two custodians uh, is maximized, between every two custodians is maximized. And um, the IRM exogenous arrivals follow, uh, arrive at each node, and then we're going to follow Zipfian popularity distribution with parameter 0. Point. Yes? A question about IRM. Mm -hmm. um, is this assuming that there is a non uniform probability of different types of requests and just that they don't bunch up within a request stream? Is that what independence means? Independence means that um, a certain file has, a popu has some popularity. Let's say it's, it is a 0 0.1. And those can vary. Popularity. And you will find, if you look at the stream, you'll get you know, one-tenth of the requests will be for that file. But how are they interspersed is independent. So we, the, and, and in a sense, like, so if, if, yes, so that's, that's what it means. And what are the time scales considered? In well, IRM actually doesn't refer to time. It's just talking about order. Um, so it's, so it, doesn't, it doesn't actually take into account the, the, the gaps. Okay. But uh, we used, in order to generate this, the, this traffic, we used um, exponential inter-arrival times. So uh, exponential distribution does follow IRM in the sense that, in other words, what we did, let, let me take that back. We generated a request arrived, the interval between two requests in terms of time was exponentially distributed. And then each time we a request arrived, we randomly selected from, based on the popularity distribution, which request is going to be, is going to be. Now the performance that we look at in this context is the missed probability ratio, or NPR. What this says is, the, one of the most uh, um, uh, significant metrics of a cache is its missed probability. Meaning, given the load and given the cache uh, uh, protocols, what is, uh, you know, for a random request that arrives at the cache, what is going to be the chance that it will be a cache miss and will be a cache hit? So we'd like, for, at least for a single cache, we'd like this value to be as low as possible. And the missed probability ratio is simply, what is going to be the missed probability based on the simulation, what actually occurs in the system based on our simulation, divided by what's the missed probability at the approximation. So how well do we uh, uh, predict this? And as you can tell, so a value of one would mean a perfect prediction. If it's greater than one, that means that there are more misses taking place than, 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 than is predicted by ANET. And if it's less than one, you'd have to mean that the ANET is predicting more misses than actually occur. So here are the results of our, this experiment, or several experiments. Sorry. Yes? Um, so when you say approximation, you... I mean ANET. Yeah, so the, 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 the major factor there is the, um, the independence, so you're assuming. Oh, we'll get into what the factor. Are you, are you asking what is the major reason that it might err, that it might not be? So we'll get to that in those two slides. It's, there's more than just that. Yes. Okay. So let's look at an example over here. So here we have, um, on the x-axis, we have the uh, cache ID. This is not by any topological order. I simply sorted the values here to, so they were in ascending order, so it's nice to see. And the y-axis over here is NPR. As you can see, all the values are above 1. That means that in all the cases that we looked at, the approximation algorithm is giving us, uh, uh, predicts less misses uh, than is actually occurring. We're getting more misses than, um, uh, than actually than, than we predict. And we look at three scenarios where F is the number of files and C is the size of the cache. Okay, So that means um, uh, the size of the number of unique files that are in the system. As you can see, we get closer to 1, meaning closer to a better approximation for values where the f divided by c, where the number of files divided by the cache size, grows. So as the, cache, as, the, as the ratio between the number of files and the cache size grows, we're getting better and better performance of our algorithm in predicting uh, uh, the performance of, uh, of, of, of the system. Yes? So just a general question here. When I looked at these graphs and uh, a number of other graphs in the dissertation, I think these numbers are fabulously low, okay? Mm -hmm. I mean, just 
awesomely small error rate. Yes. And to the point that I almost don't care about the, the differences you're showing here. Right. Am I, can you give a, a sense of, of how bad this is, this error rate is, just in terms of, is 3% a lot or a little in this kind of uh, right. world? So, um, well, I, I think what, what, what's important to realize, and we, this doesn't appear in the presentation, in the, in the, in the thesis, but, um, but in other experiments I have run, if you don't look just at the misprobability ratio, if you think about what, what this means, it means that in every hop, you're erroring a bit, right? So if you look at the miss rates, this can actually accumulate, right? So every time you're, you're, you're erroring by a little percentage, but this can actually accumulate over, over hops. So this, this might, so therefore, these percentages might or might not be significant depending on how long the path is that you're looking at. Um, so that's why this, this, might be, this might be important. Yes? What are the underlying miss rates? If, if they are very tiny, then this error is negligible. If they are high, then we should look at them. Oh, so you're asking, you know, overall, is this even a good idea to have a cache network? You're asking? No, no, no. So what are you asking? That's my question. What are the underlying? Uh, so the ratio. Uh, what are the uh, the real value? The ratio, oh, what are the real uh, miss rates? What are the real miss rates you're asking? Um, I uh, don't remember. I mean, like I did experiments, um, you know, a few like a year or two ago, but I I, I don't want to say with with with, for, with certainty. The, the, there are a lot of parameters. Uh, I thought that's the most important criteria, isn't it? Well, you know, so you're right. That is the most important criteria if you're actually uh, implementing the system, right? Because you want to know in practice what happens, but. For two reasons, I, I, I didn't go into this here. Number one is that I'm interested in the approximation, not in the in how well the approximation does to mo model the system. And for every system, there could be different results. The other thing is that in actual systems, really, you'd have to. There are a lot of parameters that it's very difficult to know how much they reflect what would really happen in a real system because you, you have to talk about the arrival, the arrival, the arrival distribution, the cache sizes, the topology, which is the bane of all this research because you never know like. What is the actual topology of the system? Where are the custodians placed? So there's so many parameters. I could construct situations where the misprobability was really good, and those are true where it's really bad. So I think that the better part, so therefore, we didn't, I didn't go into that in detail in my research. But I agree with you that any person who would, uh, um, could now take ANET and look and say for his system what, what they predict. Yes. But if I could follow on to that, I, I think the point is that to interpret that number, MPR, Right. We actually need to know something about the underlying miss rate. Okay. okay. Um, <laughs> because if it's not, if the miss rate is is ninety five percent, the fact that you're saying ninety seven percent, that seems like a big difference. Whereas if the miss rate is is three percent, and you're saying three point two oh two, you know, okay, I'm not, I'm, I'm impressed. I'm more impressed than I am in the other cases. I understand. Okay, I mean that's that's a. Uh, I agree that in practice uh, that's uh, that's true. Um, and uh, okay, I, I I didn't look at that too much, but uh, I, I accept that is an interesting thing to look at. Okay, so now back to what Lishan uh, mentioned a moment ago. So where really do the inaccuracies come from? Right, they could come from really not one but three three sources of error. One of them is that you might be using a bad SCA algorithm. Right, I could generate many SA algorithms that will give us bad performance, uh, even on an independent cache. Then there is, of course, the dependencies, which we just mentioned before. There are dependencies in the midstream, which are not expected, not expressed in the models for these approximation algorithms. So we're feeding this approximation algorithm a kind of flow that it's not designed to, 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 to deal with. And finally, this is what I mentioned also before about the fact that we have this sort of from, 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 from node to node, you're, you're going to be increasing your error because this is an iterative fixed point algorithm. So in every iteration, we're using the output from the previous iteration to feed the input for the next iteration. So that means that if I have a small error based on the first two points, I still can have accumulated over multiple iterations of the algorithm a larger error. Because each time I'm feeding slightly off input, which might cause additional slightly off output, and repeat, it and repeat this process. So we would like to know at least what, how much each of these components is impacting performance. Yes. I, I think the propagation error should decrease if you do have converged, uh, converged uh, algorithm there. I mean, intuitive. I just no, I, I think you're right. If okay. it was, if it was going, if it was, it might not have converged if it was not. Uh, yeah. But in the converged case, point. can you say the propagation error will be diminishing at least? Um, 
So I don't have any sense of uh, proving that, meaning um, I guess the question would be then, okay, so so like maybe as the size of the network would grow though, the propagation error would be more and more and more impact, right? Because maybe I'm only off by a small amount, but but it, but each time it get, but, it, but it can sort of accumulate. Um, and I, I think that's really that's really the question. Back, you know. Right. I mean, I, I see intuitively why why you think that because okay. if it was not if it was uh, completely going off, so it would it would not converge probably. But okay. um, but I uh, I don't have any theoretical proof for that. That's true. In this context, we're just interested in trying to see, for a specific example, what um, what really what impacts uh, this, uh, this. So, we took a very um, um, what I believe an interesting approach to do this, which is to basically try to isolate for each one of these components what their error impact was on the eventual result of ANA. So, here's an example of how we isolated the non-IRM uh, impact, the, the, the non-IRM flow impact on the performance. And we did similar things also for the other um, for the other parameters. So we simulate the, the system behavior, okay, as as is, and we extract from it rij, meaning the, the the rates of arrivals at each node for each file. Then for each one of the nodes individually, we take these rij's for node i, and we simulate the behavior of the cache, but this time using irm, meaning assuming that the arrivals are independent but following this these rates. And then we look at the NPR of the initial simulation. Okay, that's here the simulation. And we divide that by the probability of miss of the IRM simulation. So if you look at these two simulations, in one and both of them we're using, well, first of all, we're simulating, so we're not impacted by errors in the approximation. And we're also using the same arrival rates. The only difference is that in the IRM simulations, those, those rates follow IRM, whereas in the natural simulation, those those rates uh, follow uh, whatever whatever flows were the misflows in their combination. So that if we compare these two, we can see how much just the lack of IRM uh, affects performance. So here's an example of um, implementing this approach. So we have here, again, the x-axis is the cache ID. Values here are sorted according to the ascending values of the red, red plot, which is the actual uh, NPR okay, between the uh, uh, simulation and, and ANET. And then we have here, this green line here, which is the impact of non-IRM flows. So if we only isolated those, what would be the, the NPR, right? So we see that it's even a bit higher, right? We're getting even a bit off, further off from the actual uh, behavior of value of one. If we just look at the SCA error, which is the black line over here, so we see it's very close to one. So our approximation algorithm um, which, we, which we were using in this, in this uh, work was pretty, pretty close to optimal in terms of its ability to predict the misses for a given uh, uh, cache. And if we looked at what the propagation error or what, what impact that had, it actually made things seem a bit worse than what they were, right? We, the, the approximation, if you just use the, uh, um, um, if you just look at the propagating error, it predicted more misses than actually what would have occurred. Okay, so from this uh, result and other results that we've seen uh, for similar, um, for other, other scenarios, we conclude that the dependencies within the stream are definitely the major impact on the, uh, the, the largest impact on the, uh, on the system performance. Um, and so, so yeah, that, so that's, I mean, we can use this approach for, for any, uh, like for other topologies and for other, other scenarios as well. Yes? I guess the question I have is, of course, if you did this, a very specific SCA for LRU. Yes. How do you know this holds in general? Well, what if you use random or flight phone? So how do I know if the dependency, if the fact that dependencies are central, or if this approach for LRU? No, no, that, uh, that you present this in the thesis as if this is a, a, almost a universal truth. Oh, I see, okay, so. And, uh, and so, right. so I, I look I, at this and they're gonna say, it, well, if I use random, uh, that's the so do you believe that that's the case we have evidence uh, No, no, I, I definitely do not claim this is true for every replacement policy, and if I made that, uh, uh, if I hinted that the thesis is not a mistake on my part. Um, actually, for random, I, I would, if I would have to guess, I would say that for random, the um, lack of IRM is not as, it doesn't have as strong an impact as it does on LRU or FIFO. I would say that FIFO probably has a similar behavior, but for random, my guess would be uh, that that would not be as, 
as, as uh, seen. In general, ANET, if you plug in ANET with random, you find that it's much closer, the, the errors are much smaller. And, um, so you've done experiments with random? Yeah. I did, I did, I think I did once kind of analysis, but I don't want to, I just one experiment with that, and, but, but I don't uh, recall specifically what the results were there, but, um, but I, I didn't, I do want to do that actually. Uh, I, I can tell you that with, that ain't it on its own, with random for the same topology and request rates, it does uh, much better in terms of its prediction. Okay, so we'll just quickly overview a few other results that we had in, uh, in, in the thesis on this, and then we'll move on. So first of all, as I mentioned, we have assured uh, convergence for FIFO and random replacement. If you use them in, in, um, in, in the network, any mixture of them in the network, then you, um, you can know that ANET will converge to a fixed point solution, and we've seen this for LRU. Um, because the dependencies in the, we've seen how the dependencies in the system cause, uh, uh, cause the, 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 the strongest part of the error, we use that to motivate looking into certain topological properties that might um, ensure that we know that we'll get something sort of like better or worse performance using ANET. So for example, we looked at, let's say, trees with larger branch factors, and those branch factors cause um, requests to sort of the, mis the misstreams then mix together and they return, like the, the dependencies of the stream then get less and less. I have a slide in this, uh, and we need to talk about that more. But we basically try to motivate sort of certain topological properties that uh, might ensure better or worse performance of ANET. And we also did additional experimental evaluation, which included different arrival distributions, uh, how does the custodian place within the network affect uh, performance, and what happens when you use random instead of LRU uh, as your replacement policy. I just have a quick question. Yes. So, so the uh, convergence result, uh, you prove it uh, by proving a monotonicity property. Yes. Um, is it the case that the monotonicity property doesn't hold for LRU? Or is it, or is it just does that it, you have no, 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 it does not hold real. It doesn't. It does not. Yes. Um, so if, if you have convergence, you have, to, you have to use some other kind of... Convergence. Yes. And actually, I have, I have a general sense of how to prove it. Uh, the way I would try uh, to prove it would be, I believe that um, this is just my intuition. It's not... I've, I've tried different ways of, of showing it, but I haven't been able to yet. That in some sense, in each iteration of ANET, the, the difference in terms of the... Like if you look at the misstream and you look at the difference that between the, the total misstream in the previous round to the total misstream in the next in this coming round, and after perhaps a few initial rounds, that difference will constantly get smaller and will eventually converge to zero. So that you can each cache individually converges. So I, I personally believe that that's sort of like the way to approach tackling it, but I, I haven't been able to prove it yet. But the fact that it's not monotonic, I can I can that that, that can be shown. I don't remember, did you work that out in the thesis? No. But it was with the... Uh, I agree. Otherwise, people are going to spend their uh, weeks uh, trying to prove the money to this. Okay. Oh. Question? Yes. Uh, you're evaluating your uh, scheme uh, based on the, the metric uh, ratio between the missiles. Yep. Is a misrate? The only metric of this consequence in uh, such a network, or that's well, of course not. I mean, I mean, you're of course right. There are other metrics which we could use. Um, this probability is a good metric because it looks at a um, an individual cache, and it says what's an individual cache's performance, and it's it, it, and it sort of uh, doesn't refer to the specific rates, which are always going to be proportionate to something. Like so, the numbers From there. The point of view of the user, they don't care about a particular cache. Right, but once they you want have to know how long it will take to get the data. That is true. But once you have the missed probabilities, then from that you can extract the uh, the behavior at each at each user, right? Because you can basically look hop by hop and see what's going to happen. You can basically plot, you know, look at each hop and see what's the probability of a miss here, and see if, what's the probability of reaching the next hop, and so on. And as I said, I've run experiments that don't appear here. Uh, where I looked at the miss miss rate, which of course is, um, uh, as you say, like the um, what it, what effectively people experience, right? What the custodian experience, and there you can see that really sort of you you're um, um, there the gaps are a bit bigger because in each hop you have you have uh, like some probability of error, right? So each hop in the network you're misestimating by a little bit, and then that prop that that increases. On the other hand, what, all, what I've also seen though I didn't show it over here. In, didn't uh, run enough experiments to demonstrate it in the thesis, is that um, 
the rate distribution, those, those RIJs, if we ignore the, uh, um, the uh, dependencies, those actually seem to be more or less maintained. It's just the dependencies within them uh, that, are, that, are causing, that are causing problems. That's sort of why the propagating error is, very, is relatively minor. So what you are saying is that by looking only at the issue of the miss rate, you are uh, drawing an optimistic picture. Because if you look at the total time until the data is assumed, the, the error will be much bigger. Because they, it, it will accumulate. Yeah, so you're asking me what does it mean about, well, I'm not, so I'm not sure if you're asking a question about the approximation or about, um, or about the performance of the system. Um, I'm, well, my focus here was analyzing how well my approximation yes, estimates so the behavior of the system. So in terms of time, be higher if you will look at the total time until the data is received because you'll have to miss several caches. That's true, the error there might be, might be large, yes, that's true. I'm not, that, that, I mean, I still uh, uh, stand by the fact that, the, um, that that information is all encapsulated in the missed probability ratio. You can extract that from there. Just give me the path and I will tell you what the, what, what the error there will be for your specific, for specific screen. Okay. So actually, I was going to rephrase Israel's question before he asked it. Okay. But let me then ask a follow-up. Is, is it straightforward? So now if you worry about accumulating errors and let's say the performance metric is how many hops do I have to go right. until I until I until I get a hit, is it is it trivial to go from those per hop? Remember you're comparison, you're comparing analysis with simulation and now right. it's a simulation of now going from multiple hops. Is it trivial just to accumulate that or is it possible that there'll be effects that you could own that would show up in simulation but just sort of uh, convolving what happens along the path? Well, first of all, the analysis we did here, which we did for the missed probability for the entire, um, um, like for, for, the, for, the, for, for every cache, you could also use the, the same approach to break it down per file. So number one is, maybe you could say like, you know, what's the missed probability per file? And we've, we've run experiments, uh, which I didn't go into in the thesis of trying to see sort of where the error is, is, uh, is greater and like sort of very popular files are not affected by the error too much, very unpopular files are not affected too much. It's, the middle range that is more impacted because um, uh, very popular files you'll tend to find very quickly and anyway, so it's not going to be such a big difference. Um, but yeah, but once you have, the, but but in terms of being able to extract it, once you have the missed probability, whether per file or overall for each cache, then it's only a question of like accumulating them over the hops. I don't think that there's anything else you need in order to determine what's going to be the probability of like. If you try to determine, let's say, the probability of the length of a request, like the length of the request path, that's, that's all you need. Right, but the question is not your, your approximate analysis of the length, but the difference between if you compute that using your model versus simulating it and see what it is. Right, so, so, and so I'm not sure what your question is. Uh, there will be a difference, which is a factor of those errors. Like per, per cache, you basically multiply those. So it'll make, so if I had two caches which had um, uh, 1.5 error, then my error in combined will be 2.25, right? So that's sort of, um, uh, in terms of the, how long the, uh, um, you know, the miss, the miss can be. So that can grow, which is why, it, that's what I answered earlier to, to Professor Jensen when, when it came up, sort of like the idea of. Can I go to slide 28? Sure, sir. Slide 28? Yeah, I, I just want to be concrete. Sure. What do you think this looks like if you use average delay instead of uh, ah. this one? Right. Uh, but, oh, if the average delay means the number of hops. Yeah, let's say you measure the number of hops. You think so, uh, it'll, there'll be greater error or less error? I believe it will be greater, yes, because you basically are going to move between, let's say, it's only a multiplication of these values, like as the length of the hop. So if you, if the probability of the hop being one, of the length being one, is going to be like the first hop is going to be in the, uh, this exact value. The probability of there being two hops will be the error on one, then multiply by the error on the other. And so you're going to basically accumulate that along the search path. OK. So with that, um, we conclude our discussion of ANET for now. And we'll move on to uh, network calculus. So in ANET, we tried to approximate the behavior of a cache network. There is another way of trying to uh, model a system, and that is by bounding it. 
So in, similar, in a similar way, but uh, an importantly different way, we uh, do this uh, for, for cache networks. We try to bound the flows that, that flow through the network. So as an input this time, we're going to take, instead of the actual flow, the exogenous arrivals, we're going to take a deterministic upper bound on, on these flows. And we will try to produce tight upper bounds on the mystery. So if we, I really should write here, we take deterministic tight upper bounds and we produce tight upper bounds on the mystery. Uh, what I mean by tight, I will uh, be happy to get into later, but for now, um, it, it's, in other words, uh, uh, we'll go into it if, if, if uh, you have any questions about what tightness means in this context. So how do we down the flow? So here we draw upon the work by Cruz for queuing networks. Um, and what you do is you, um, what's called the rho sigma or sigma rho uh, characterization, where rho reflects the average rate for requests, and sigma reflects uh, some burstiness component, um, which we will define below here in the slide. So we assume that we have some flow of requests, RIT, that's telling us the, re the request rate for file i at the node, at the time t. And if we are able to bound this flow, then we look at uh, the total number of requests that arrived over a certain window. And we, if the bounds hold, that means that lambda rho i multiplied by the size of the window, this is the average rate, plus the burstiness, um, is going to bound the flow from above. We take the upper the, the ceiling of this just so, so that we can deal with individual requests arriving or not arriving and not dealing with fractional requests, um, just so that the meaning of things is clear. And so if you want to get a visual of what we mean over here, so you can take a look at this example here. Um, we have here this uh, the, uh, time t on the x-axis and y we have the accumulated number of arrivals. And then we have here this green line, which indicates the RIT function. And if we start the window between these two points, so this blue line indicates the, uh, the rate component, the average rate component, and this yellow line indicates, the yellow arrow indicates the um, burstiness component, which sort of shows us that we can see that this indeed bounds it. The green line never goes above the blue line plus, the, plus this extra, extra distance. And our vision is to try and do the following. Take a, um, a, ca a cache router, feed into it these, instead of the actual flow arrivals, feed into it the, the ca these upper bounds for each flow, okay, for files one through n, and then compute bounds on the mystery. And then once we have those bounds, we can easily combine them with other bounds. So if at the next hop we receive these and this bounds, and they receive them from several neighbors, each one of them, let's say for file i, yeah, for file one, so they're arriving these sigma row bounds from each one of the neighboring caches. So we can easily combine these sigma row characterizations. Because if you have an uh, average arrival rate of uh, from one, well, average arrival miss rate from one node, which is, let's say, five, and average arrival rate um, from node two, which is three, then their combined arrival rate is eight. So it's easy to combine these, these bounds and generate input for the next time. So how do we do this? So um, we have the intuition over here. So um, uh, we look over here at some sort of window of okay, time. And we consider four files. We have here the blue files, white, shaded, and the plus file. And we have five blue files, four uh, white files, two shaded, and two plus. And in this arrangement, if we had the request arriving in this, in this uh, order, then the first blue file would be a cache miss, because the file is no, not there yet. And the rest would be cache hits because once it was cached, it's already going to be able to satisfy requests. And the same thing for each one of those, the first request will be a hit, and the rest will be a miss, or the rest will be a hit. So the miss will have one event, one request of each of each file. But we can take the same number of requests. Here again, we have five blue ones, four white ones, and two of the other of each of the other kind, rearrange them and generate many more requests. So for example, here we can see the first of each is going to be a miss. And because the cache size is three, these three requests will evict the blue file that was cached after this event. So the next request for blue will also be a miss. But not the next one after that, because it's already still in there. So you can see how arranging these things, is, these, these requests basically determine what is going to be the miss, miss law. And when we're trying to bound the miss law, we need to find the worst case arrangement. Like, what is the arrangement that will generate the most misses for our system? 
So in order to do that, let's define a little bit of terminology and some basic intuition of LRU. So a mist set, which has names that appear elsewhere also in the literature, um, uh, we call it a mist set, uh, is a set containing C plus one unique request, where C is the size of the cache. Okay, so it's called a mist set because, as I mentioned a moment ago, if I have, if, be, if, um, if before, if I have a C plus one requests sequentially being requested in the cache for unique files, at least the last request will for sure be a cache miss because um, the previous C request will have evicted it if it was in the, in the cache at the beginning. Um, a miss sequence with respect to a certain file is indeed an ordered miss set where the last request or requests are for this file. Now LRU has a property which, uh, we discussed in, 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 which is a very well known property where the number of misses over for, for a request for FJ over a certain window is equal to the number of missed sequences in that window. Okay, so if we can maximize, if we can arrange the, the, the request in such a way that would maximize the number of missed sequences for a specific file, it would generate the worst uh, behavior for that file. And the flow conservation property, which is, uh, goes back to what we mentioned earlier, is that the, the cache doesn't do any reordering of, of requests. It simply filters them so that we know for certain that um, no reordering or, or injecting. We know that the output OWJ, the output over W, a window of W, for a request for file J, meaning the cache misses over file J, are going to be bounded by the arrival, by the incoming requests um, at uh, node J, uh, for file J over the course of window W. So, in order to bound, using these sort of like this intuition, uh, in order to bound um, the, the flows, we find this term MW, which is the maximum number of missed sets over a window W. So for, let's just take an example to get a sense of what this means. So we have here seven lab requests, five green requests, we have red requests, three orange, and one purple request. And we want to generate, we want to see what MW is. So we can arrange these in sets of four, right? Because the cache size is three, so C plus one is four. And we can arrange it in all sorts of ways. And we want to arrange it in such a way that maximizes the number of missed sets in, uh, in the, of, of these uh, events. So here is the way, that, so this is, let's say, the optimal, one of the optimal arrangements. Uh, so you see we have basically four of these sets of size four. And then on the side here we have some extra requests, which we, which, which we can't generate from them alone another missed set, right? Because we need unique files, not, uh, not just a number of files. And our first theorem shows that we already know before that the output um, misses basically for window W for file J is bounded by IWJ by the arrivals, but it's also bounded by by this value by MW, and in fact that this bound is um, is tight. And there's two points I want to make about this about this uh, statement. First of all, um, as I was uh, thinking about it um, last night, unable to sleep naturally. Um, I, um, I realize that there's a little bit of a nuance over here which doesn't uh, impact things, but I want to make it clear. Um, this, this value here actually needs to be implemented just by a, by a single one if we assume that the cache is empty at the beginning, because the first request will always be a miss, right? But after that first request, you're going to have like, everything else will be, uh, uh, will follow this. And uh, all the other theorems are, not, are unchanged as a result of this. Um, I was actually debating if I should even mention that I realized this. Uh, I figured I'll, I'll give it a shot. So um, what's interesting about this theorem is that, and this is really one of the most interesting results of this, of this work, is that MW, you see it doesn't have any, any in, it doesn't use any subscript indicating which file we're looking at. This MW is actually the same value for every one of the files, every one of the streams. So essentially what this theorem is saying is that if you look at a certain window and you look at the output stream, then what LRU is doing in the worst case, of course, right? This is the worst case analysis, the bounding. What it's doing is it's basically saying, it's basically taking all the more popular files and it's defining a, co a cutoff point, saying the number of misses that can pass cannot pass this cutoff point. So unpopular files will remain unchanged in terms of what their, their arrivals and misses will be identical because that's in the worst case, of course, this is the bound. Um, and the popular files will have this sort of cutoff point where nothing will uh, pass that value. So now that we have that theorem, that's just for a window and a, a finite number of requests, but we want to get these down, we want to get sigma rho bounds 
not just uh, uh, these values. So we have four additional theorems. Theorem two states that rho i out, meaning the misrate, the, the rho component, the rate component, is not impacted by the burstiness components. So we can, we can, we can basically bound it independent of what the, uh, the burstiness components are. We then show, similar to the theorem from the previous page, from the previous slide, that rho i out, the misrate, is bounded by, of course, the, the arrival rate, rho i n, and some value n, which is um, basically mw as um, um, sort of like the mean number of miss, of, of miss sets you can construct. Over here, there's no need to add the one. This is true as it is. Um, theorem four states uh, the bounds on the burstiness, which are kind of long and complex and I won't go into right now, but we can talk about them afterwards. And theorem five shows that not only are these bounds, are these bounds true, but they actually can hold in parallel. We can actually have, uh, it's not that the, bound, the worst case for one will ensure the best case for the other. Rather, we can, there is a scenario where these worst case, where these worst case bounds can apply to all files uh, uh, in parallel. So then, once we had these, these theorems and we had a way to compute the bounds, we wanted to look at uh, how the system, uh, how, how close are these bounds to actual behavior. So we took a look at this uh, topology. We start off at, uh, we have a tree. The tree to look like it's a hierarchy. Like it's a hier hierarchy, a uh, cash hierarchy. And actually, you put the custodians not at the root, but over here, you see that these two nodes at the leaves. And each one of them, and if we, each one of them you see holds a different piece of content. And one of the things that's nice about this topology is that it gives you a chance to see both the behavior of hierarchies and the behavior of networks where there's also cross flows and all the things we talked about earlier. Because these nodes over here are completely oblivious to the fact that there is this cross flow taking place at the, uh, that, that, there's, that, there, that the content is not at the root. This is before request upstream and receive it from, from upstream downstream. But along the path between these two nodes, uh, 7 and 14, you have cross flows. You have requests going in opposite directions. Okay, so we get a chance to see sort of the behavior on both of these um, scales, on both of these um, perspectives. So we took 600 unique files, divided among these two custodians. Um, um, we had several experiments, the ones I'm going to show now, were involved uh, uh, exogenous request uh, popularity following zip distribution. And, um, and the miss rate over here is if we look at not the miss probability, because if you look at the miss probability here, it's not sure what exactly it means. Uh, remember, we're taking arrival rates, but not actually the rates, they're bounds. And we're taking the bounds and the miss rates. So dividing the bounds and the miss rates by the bounds and the arrival rates might not necessarily predict the worst case behavior, right? You might have um, sort of like, because, because you might, you might, it might, looking at the probability might not reflect the worst case behavior. The worst case behavior is actually when you have a lot of arrivals and where, where regardless of how many arrivals you have, you have a lot of misses. So, um, therefore we looked at the miss rates over here. What are my process producing? Oh, yeah, I mean, what were the, what was the, uh, so we used again like the exogenous arrivals were IRM, and uh, as before. So in that sense, it didn't change. We we had the, the interarrival uh, time between requests was was exponential, and um, yeah. so here's an example of some of the results we got. Um, the x-axis is the cache ID. This is this corresponds to what you saw in the previous in, in, uh, in the chart in the tree topology. The y-axis is the miss rate ratio or the value above one means uh, the bounds are, uh, we're dividing the bounds by the actual performance. So the values all should be above one, because we're, this is an upper bound, above or equal to. And in this case, you can see, for example, that um, there's a few things you can learn from this, and there are other examples in the paper. But you can see, for, the, for example, that again, as we saw with ANET, as the cache size gets smaller, and also if you increase the number of files, you're getting you're moving from this blue line to the red line. So you're getting better performance here. Now, better performance here, let's just move on what it means. Better performance here for a bounding algorithm indicates that the bounds are getting closer to the actual behavior. In other words, we're getting closer and closer to the worst case behavior of, an indiv of each individual cache. Now, I want to make it clear that I'm not saying that this doesn't mean, this is not trying to say that there are more misses when there's a cache of size 20 than when you have a cache size 50. That is, that is obvious. What's being said over here is that the bounding algorithm is getting, is predicting better what is what the actual performance will be, okay? Um, 
these results combine, can actually uh, be combined nicely within what we saw in ANET, but I'll talk about that more maybe a bit later uh, if, uh, if, if we have time. I have a question. I could imagine when the cache size is 20, that you have lots and lots of misses, uh, in which case I have sort of a trivial bound of just taking the rate as if there was no cache. <coughs> I'm curious what that rate should be looking for. Oh, I see. Um, if the missed probability is, let's say, 0.9, right, let's see if how much the we have to rate, uh, the ratio is going to be 0.1 <coughs> at right. worst. Yes, I agree. That's actually a good point. Um, it might be interesting to see sort of what, what your basis is to see how much um, added benefit does this bound give us compared to uh, actual behavior, like to just you know, looking at that trivial approach. And I think that what that also means which I was about, to, which is what I was going to say also, is that it uh, connects to the question of, are these gap networks really a useful way of managing information? If we get such a low, if we get so close to the worst case, should we really be even be using the system, right? Meaning because we're not actually making the cache arm and the utilize arm helping us, they're generating too many misses. So um, first of all, I, I didn't try it out, but I think that's a very definitely an interesting thing to look at. Um, but with regards to the question about the sort of what this means, the fact that the bounds are getting closer and closer as this ratio grows. And it, we can expect that this ratio will be high because uh, this ratio of number of files to the cache size will grow. Uh, I have sort of two, two thoughts about it. Number one is that this is for LRU, and my conclusion after working with this a lot is that LRU and FIFO and all these deterministic policies have a um, sort of an inherent problem with cache networks, and so random replacement, or adding randomness to the replacement policy. Um, I think is essential if you want to make, make good use of the, of the system. And indeed, there's a paper that came out um, just like a few months ago that talked about uh, trying to model how a cache network with random replacement would, would behave, and they showed that it was did pretty good. But the, um, um, the other thing is that this connects also a little bit to my uh, talk, and if you like to the chapter after next, of breadcrumbs, which is that this, these results indicate that at least the trivial approach of looking for content in the direction of the custodian might not generate uh, the kind of results you want, and that you may need to think better about how you route the requests. So in addition to, in addition to these results, we also looked at bounds from non irm exogenous flows. So one of the big benefits of a bounding approach here is that it doesn't depend on the IRM assumption. You can apply these also when the, uh, the arrivals do not follow IRM. And so we looked at uh, um, uh, other non irm exogenous flows. We uh, consider the impact of the increase in cross flows, so changing where the content is placed to generate more or less cross flows and see how that affected uh, performance. And we also looked at this and used this tool in a different way just to analyze how closely they are we to the worst case. Because here, too, just like with ANET, some of these values are not only a result of the bounding, it's also a result of the propagating error. Uh, and, and bounds, you always have propagating error, right? Because I'm using the bounds from the previous. Uh, hop to the bounds here. What are the actual behavior of each each node that we also looked at to see sort of you know how well does LU suit cache networks? And also there we saw that as you go more hops you get worse and worse behavior. Okay. So with that, moving on to the last piece of modeling work is uh, the work of ergodicity. Um, taking a bit longer than I expected, but the uh, request so okay. Um, and that is the uh, talking about the impact of the initial state. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, this work, uh, there's not much that was done since the proposal, so I'll just review it quickly. But if we want to go into it more in depth, uh, we can do that. Um, so what is the what is the question we address here? So a cache state is what is stored in the cache. And um, we define a quasi-ergodic cache network as a network in which the probability, one way to think about it, I mean, it's not the way you talk about it in the paper, but intuitively, we would like the probability of finding a file in, 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 a, in a specific node to be independent of the initial state of the system. So you start placing the system is starting maybe with empty caches, maybe with you know, some initial placement of content in the, in the network, and then you begin to run it with sort of repeat users generating requests, and you expect eventually uh, for it to converge to some, you know, under a certain load to some steady state. But the thing is, we've shown that, and in that case, you can also just assume that the properties of the system depend only on user demand, cache size, topology, and we can ignore this, in both in analysis and in simulation. 
Um, however, while standalone caches, such as FIFO and LRU are, in this sense that we talked about earlier, they are ergodic, um, what do we do about uh, uh, network caches? Because with network caches, the state of, of, of neighboring caches might somehow affect, it. they might affect each other. The requests are generated by one and then content is downloaded into both of them, so are they somehow locked in to a certain set of states instead of, um, instead of converging to, to a specific state? And we have actually found two examples. I'll show one simple one in the next slide. And we found two examples uh, which are distinct uh, in, in, their, in what happens in them of non ergodic CN. So we also then saw the need to show, to prove, with, you know, to give conditions that prove with, about certain uh, networks what are they or are they non ergodic. So let's look at a simple scenario over here. You have two scenarios that are identical in terms of the system setup. They both have two custodians with different files stored in the custodian. Here are just one file in each. You have caches of size one. Um, sorry? Did you? Okay. Um, we have two consumers, one red and one blue, which indicates what content they're interested in. Okay? The only difference here is what is the initial state of the system. In other words, here, in both cases, V1 is holding the blue file. But V2 here is only the red one, here is only the green one. So the only difference here is what is the initial state of the caches? And if we look at the upper one, we're going to get a series of requests generated by the consumer or by a set of consumers. And these requests will always generate a cache hit. And never will anything change, assuming that the request patterns don't change. Nothing will change in terms of uh, the state of the system. But lower down, in the second case, there will be a cache miss at both V2 and V1 don't have the red file, then the red file will be downloaded and will basically stash, restore over here the red file instead of what was there before. And you can see how now the system is going to be in flux. It's going to be, actually it's going to be constantly in flux in terms of what, what is stored. It's going to be either storing both reds or both blues each time, but never will it converge to this state. So we really have sort of two, the only difference here is the initial, initial system, initial state of the, of the system. This is actually a, uh, the more simple example. There are more complex examples, which we still don't fully understand. We know that they, that they indeed generate similar behavior. So in our work, we presented uh, conditions which each one of them independently is sufficient for uh, uh, ergodicity of the network, which are uh, feed forward kind of cache networks. So similar to hierarchies, but more generalization of a hierarchy where requests all go uh, on, on each link a request goes in one direction and content is forwarded on in the opposite direction. Um, cache networks with probabilistic caching, so we don't store every uh, piece of content, only some fraction of the content that passes through the cache. Uh, we looked at it where it's really just a probabilistic method, like it's not, not in the words, we just select randomly what, what, the, what the, uh, to choose, what to store. And most importantly, if you have non-protectable placement policies, which is a term that we, we defined in the thesis, which includes LRU random, uh, LFU, not FIFO though. Uh, at least we haven't been able to, FIFO, we have an example which shows a cache network where it cannot, where it's not ergodic. Um, for these policies, we know that the system is ergodic. So we really have here three conditions. One that refers to the topology, one that refers to the replacement policy, and one that refers to the admission control at the cache that will determine if or not, uh, that will do at least in a positive way that we know that the system is ergodic. So, so when you say independently sufficient, you mean I just have to have one the word, yeah. Yes. But I don't care how your placement policy works. That's true. There are there's one assumption that I mentioned in the thesis, which is I assume that the example that I used over here actually had another element which made it a bit more easy to manipulate, which was that the consumers here request um, disjoint uh, um, sets of files, right? One requests only the red, one requests only the blue. These all assume, uh, I have to think if they if that's necessary for each of these, but, they, but in the paper, at least in our work, we always assume that every file is requested with some probability that is uh, maybe very negligible, but with some probability at each node. So every, every consumer is requesting each file, but in, with some maybe small probability. But under, those, some, under that assumption alone, each one of these holds independent. Yes. So with that, we conclude the modeling uh, work that I did. And um, I'll just give a quick review of like some of the other work that's been done, just to, so we understand where this sits. Um, unless um, should I? Why don't you do this quickly? I, uh, we want to make sure that you're done by say uh, 
25 or 20 of them. Okay. So just briefly, so there's been work on hierarchies. Uh, we have here with um, some work on Ivan Rodriguez on CDNs. Uh, Che did uh, a, a mean approx and mean, um, um, mean approx, what's it called? Mean, I don't know, I don't know where to go. Um, I forget the name. Well, so Che et al. dealt with, um, uh, with a tree, with cash trees, and, um, um, and they show that basically the caches do this sort of, have this sort of like a, a low, they function as a low pass filter, which uh, resonates with what we saw for in, in the bounding work, where we sort of have a cap. It bounds the the miss, uh, the miss rate. Um, Borsch and and Charles also looked at 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 um, at, uh, at, uh, at uh, hierarchies. They used a convex uh, these Borsch they recall used convex programming to do to, to solve it. Uh, but none of these refer to uh, general topologies with multiple uh, custodians. And this work of cache networks in general, the field of modeling it, is actually very related to hybrid peer to peer networks. Um, where you have a peer-to-peer -peer system, and you also have a, something like a custodian, that's why it's hybrid. You have like a, a source you can always turn to if you can't find the content 